Hello everyone, this is Ben Lee, and today we're going to do something a little bit different. I had a really, really good suggestion for a video off of the member Discord. So if you're a member, uh, Suda McGill level or higher, and you haven't joined the Discord, you should do so. You'll, you'll have access to something in your membership perks. You just go hit your see perks button, it'll show you the link to the Discord if you use Discord. If you don't, no, no sweat, but it's kind of like the fast bat phone do. This guy. Well, nonetheless, uh, our good friend, Elkwin Jenna, who's the one that supplied me with the uh, USB new air pump with the battery backup from Aquarium Co-op that we pulled apart to show all the internals, she had a really good idea. We're going to talk about tank dynamics. And what this means is like the fish we keep inside our aquariums, how those things can change based on factors we might not consider. Let's start with a little story direct from our member who had the idea. And uh, I'm going to I'll put this up, the, the base idea and maybe part of the story here. But uh, so she says, since the removal of my betta from my community 20 gallon, and even more so after rehoming my spotted gara to this guy, because I have some spotted garas. Notice a big change in the remaining fish in the aquarium. The pygmy quarries are out and about as soon as the lights come on. They're not hiding as much. Before, they would hide until feeding and only come out during feeding and then go back into hiding. Now they're all over the tank. Big difference, right? And we're talking about our, our very lowest on the substrate level fish. They're staying out, hanging out with the rest of the fish. I've even seen a couple of them snag flakes from the top of the water. They were not waiting for it to drop. They hang out more on the plants, swim around a lot in midwater, and even come out to take a look at me, the human. They're oh so cute, the hummingbirds of the fish world. I actually like that description. It's really good, the hummingbird of the fish world. You're onto something when they do the little hovering. So if you've ever seen quarries when they swim mid water, they just kind of do this little like hover in mid place and the way that they wiggle. I can see, I can see where your thought process is. The chili rasboras are also swimming around more of the tank and not just hanging at the very top water. When the betta was in there, they tended to stay at the top and not swim anywhere else. After the betta was removed, they did seem to swim around a bit more. I believe that the reason the chilies and the quarries were not out more when the gara was in there because of her size. It was fairly large, actually, for even a spotted gara. Probably like four inches and pretty pretty good bulky size. Bigger than any of my spotted garas. So I could understand where it seems like that's a large, potentially predatory fish. And then the last fish that are in there, some Pseudomigil luminatus, ever since... Five and uh, some neons had moved out of a five gallon into that. The moment the lights come on, all the fish are swimming around very, very freely. They're very active. Nothing seems to be hiding anymore. And then the final note, and this is what I think is most important because for us as fish keepers, we often make assumptions. And then when we see fish in our own tanks, if we don't necessarily see something we think is going to happen, we might get really disenfranchised with that fish and not appreciate it as much as we thought we were going to. This part's really critical. If I had known these quarries and chilies would behave like they do now, I would have never placed the betta in there. The gara was fine until the gara got too big. One other thing that I have learned that in all these videos about tank mates for bettas that might be okay, but in truth, maybe they fish listed should not be with a betta. For a newcomer like me, as far as behaviors go, I still have a lot to learn, but I hate the fact that in most cases, I would have to learn by doing, which to me is not fair on the fish I have taken into my care. First off, thank you so much, Jenna. Appreciate the story and the idea. Let's get this away and talk tank dynamics. We're going to wait for the cops first. We're going to use the tank behind me as an example, when I first set this tank up, it was prepared for one purpose, rainbow fish. But then, as you guys can remember in an old video, I got contacted by somebody asking me to help save their fish because their 75 gallon tank at home cracked. That's how I ended up with danger noodle and a bunch of other random quarries and some other fish that all ended up in this tank. Now, of course, 
Most of those quarries are still going. I've lost a few of them because probably old age finally settled in. And Danger Journal's still flying around in all that Java fern. But what's important to note is that at first, they hid a lot. We didn't see them out and about as often. And Danger Journal specifically loved just kind of nesting up in all of this Java fern here. There weren't fish necessarily predatory in size. The rainbows that were in this tank were all very young. They were maybe two inches. But the problem comes in the fact of how active they are. Now, with the Java fern grown in the way it is now, there's lots of places to hide. And there's lots of places where they don't necessarily have to worry about potential predators from above. So I see those Corydoras out a lot more. And now that we've added the three super noodles, if you will, Team team Thick, Danger Noodle is way more active. So there's a combination of things that are occurring here. We have these very active fish in the rainbows. Even when they were small, because of how active and how quickly they fed, certain other fish would be a bit more shy. But as the planting grew in, got way more lush, time just took by and they got used to those fish, they became more active. They found certain places where they felt good about swimming around, and some of that can be attributed to having some open swim space. So like right here, right? You see how you can see the substrate in the front of the tank. That creates open swim space, but still has shelter behind it. That encourages the Corydoras, similar in their native habitats, to know that like this is kind of like the shore. And then if we need to, we can duck back where it's safe, in the deeper parts, underneath all the java fur. In the case of Danger Noodle, it's about being social. Danger Noodle really only had to come out and do anything when Danger Noodle wanted food. Or it seemed like it was nighttime, which for most loaches is common. But now with the rest of the Team Thick in here, they're constantly out and about. It makes Danger Noodle way more comfortable. So there's two different types here. We have socialization. And we have that natural kind of like, I have a safe harbor. And I have this open space where I'm okay. I've gotten used to the fish swimming around me. They're not predators. And if they're busy and active all over the place, it means no predators are around. One thing that's very interesting, when I adopted the thick danger noodle squad here, right, I also got a bunch of white clouds. When we got the white clouds in the tank, I noticed a very interesting behavior. The Corydoras started swimming up more. We'd see them not constantly at the very bottom, but moving in and about the middle of the water column. Because they're seeing a smaller fish higher up in the water column, they feel safer. It's not just the rainbows. It's now fish even smaller than them that are in the top water acting safe. So they'll move more throughout the entirety of the water column rather than just staying along the substrate where they're in their safest environment. Another kind of scenario here, let's talk about is specifically what we're seeing with Jenna's tank. The betta fish, while it might not actively be aggressive with the other fish, because of the size in comparison to pygmy, ras or the pyg pygmy quarries and chili rasboras, it's going to be seen as some kind of potential predator, even if it's not actively predating on anything that size difference is going to discourage those smaller fish from risking themselves by going out into open water. It's just survival tactics for a lot of these small fish. Anything that's that big, probably a predator from where they come from, even though they might not have bettas in their natural habitat, right? Bettas have a very exclusive set of habitats but something that big might be something similar to a type of predatory fish from their natural habitat and trigger that hide instinct, right? That I need to be safe, I need to hide. Now, let's talk about a completely different fish, the guppy. Guppies kind of <laughs> unceremoniously beautiful, also not the smartest fish in the world. They very commonly are very top water centric fish. 
So how do we get them to swim in other places and feel comfortable going all over the place? This can be done by having other fish in the tank or other things of interest in the tank that move around in the lower areas, indicating that the whole area is safe. Go everywhere, not just the top water. And you'll often see what happens with most guppies is your babies dive down and stay lower and your adults stay in the upper water column. Adults are going to go for more of the uh, live foods, your insects and stuff like that in nature, right? <laughs> most of our guppies are way far from what they were in nature. But the babies know that if they go down low where the adults typically don't hang out, they're going to be safe to grow and feed on all sorts of micro, uh, whether it's you know, bacterias, biofilms, micro crustaceans, whatever kind of small foods that they naturally are going to feed on. Or in our case, it could even be just like powdered flake, right? Whatever they're eating, they can get plenty of it down low and be safe from potential predators in the adult fish. Where's the big problem? Because Jenna mentions this. It's hard to find things that will suggest like, they'll suggest all sorts of tank baits for a betta thinking about things that just can cohabitate with a betta, but not necessarily are those fish going to be super active and comfortable at all times? How do we fix some of those problems? The first one usually is numbers. If we're doing a small tank with especially a betta, let's talk bettas specifically here for a minute just because they're such a common fish. If we're doing something like a five gallon tank, you really probably are limiting yourself on the number of tank mates that can go with that betta. You're in a small space. We're already going to be wanting to look toward a smaller fish as is. So now you're probably going a small number of small fish because you've already got a betta in a small tank as is. That's going to cause them to be a lot less comfortable. Our smaller fish usually are more brave or active in large numbers. So this is where we're going to start looking at, okay, if I want to keep a good school of fish and have that showpiece betta or a garami or something similar like that, I probably need to scale up the size of my tank so that I can have something like 20 neon tetras or 20 chili rasboras, something like that. It's going to be in a higher number so that they feel more comfortable Numbers are very critical for our small fish to feel comfortable and feel safe. The smaller the group is, the more shy behavior you're going to see because there's kind of an assumption. There's not many of us here. That's got to be for a reason. Something's got to be picking all my friends off. I'm supposed to be in a big group. There's a, a great um, fish breeder, a guy who does talks. He's recently been in my club, Eric Bodrock. And he has a mantra that he always says in a lot of his presentations, be the fish. And this is the thing that I would encourage you to do whenever you're picking tank mates or building a community tank is think about how those fish exist. If we're looking at small schooling fish and we're going to have a larger fish in with them, even if we know that fish is peaceful, right? Rainbows are very peaceful fish but they're very boisterous when they eat, and that can be perceived, if we will, as aggressive behavior where they start darting around all over the place, getting really excitable. That can scare your smaller fish. So how do we combat that? We put larger numbers of our smaller fish into a tank and give them reasonable hiding space. So just in case they know they've got a place to hide, but over time, hopefully they get used to the fact that if they are safe, there are no actual predators and we can be out and more active. You can even see the white clouds behind me here. They're out and active despite the fact that there's this big thick boy coming out of the side of my head right here, right? They know that they're safe. They know that they're okay. And if they really have to, they have tons of protection all throughout all of this planting to go hide in. That's how we help get ourselves to a better tank dynamic to see those beautiful fish all out in force, as opposed to, I only see my quarries when I put food in the tank. I only see these fish when I put food in the tank. If we were to look at another one of my tanks that has some new fish that I want to talk about very, very soon, they swim with the rainbows in that tank. Like they're schooling together in the morning, especially. It's pretty cool. 
And it's a really interesting experience because they're kind of similar in size. It's a smaller rainbow and a kind of bigger fish. They swim together because they're not afraid of each other. They know that this fish that normally is zipping around is only going to zip around if they know there's no predators. So we have to be safe too so we can all swim together, have our fun, do our thing, root around. That's my little kind of semi-philosophical talk for today. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, maybe share it with a friend, leave a comment down below. What story do you have from keeping fish that's similar to Jenna's, where maybe you ended up removing a fish, even if that fish wasn't aggressive, and it changed the entire dynamic of the tank, and you saw some new and interesting behavior out of the fish you already had? Or maybe you had to move certain fish to a completely different tank, and when you moved them from this tank and gave them a tank on their own, all of a sudden they became a completely different fish. And something was way more interesting that made you appreciate them even more. I'd love to hear that in the comments down below. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. And stay awesome.